of the Earth as formed of a mosaic of plates, all moving relative to one another. But prior to the development of those new ideas, mountains were one of geology's great mysteries. The early geologists studied mountains in great detail, in fact. Uh, they documented the rocks that were present in them, and they documented the folds and the faults. And some of the books written by the early Swiss geologists are magnificent examples of the documentation of geological data. However, how mountains formed was a great mystery. Early geologists thought that perhaps they were rather like the wrinkles on the surface of a dried up apple. In other words, that the earth was contracting and the mountains were wrinkles on the surface. Even when I was an undergraduate, which was quite recently, mountains could not really be explained. We were simply told that they were great belts of sediment that had somehow subsided into the crust of the earth and been squeezed from both sides. Not really satisfactory explanations at all. But we can now explain mountains quite well with the advent of plate tectonics. Mountains also have their place in mythology. The Siebengebirge on the shores of the Rhine in the Rhineland are thought to be the piles of dirt that giants knocked off their shovels after they'd dug the canal, which is the Rhine. And the giant mountains on the borders of Czechoslovakia are thought to be giants who were caught out in the daylight and they were only allowed to walk at night. In this program, you will see, first of all, the discussion of the formation of mountain bolts, and secondly, in the second half hour, one of the Planet of Man programs, a case study on the Appalachians. This program is about the Appalachian Mountains, which run from Newfoundland to Alabama. They've been long studied, and many details have been well known for a long time. But there were certain mysteries about them, in particular, why they were formed at the edge of the continent. The advent of ideas about continental drift and plate tectonics has done much to explain this mystery. It's now thought that three or four hundred million years ago, the continents of Africa and Eurasia bumped into North America, and the collision pushed up the Appalachian Mountains along the joint. At that time, they were probably much higher than they are now and resembled the Himalayas or the Andes. But the passage of time and erosion has worn them down to their present general slopes. Our world 200 million years ago. The supercontinent Pangaea, its continuous coastline bordering on a universal ocean. In its irregular forms, we can read the shape of things to come as we can read familiar shapes in clouds. We can infer where India, now wedged between Africa and Antarctica, will soon commence its long journey north to collide with Asia where the Atlantic will open moving North and South America to the West. But we will have to infer much more, for on the immensity of this supercontinent, we will find none of the great mountain ranges. That too is yet to come. The margin of Southern Asia is flat, for the Himalayas will not begin to rise for another hundred million years. That event, waits for India's drift north and the collision that will lift up the mountains. The Alps, too, are nowhere evident. Before they appear, the Mediterranean must begin to close, bringing Africa in collision with Europe and folding up the great range we know today. The Andes and the mountains of Western North America will begin to appear some million years hence. They will rise up when the westward drift brings the two continents into conflict with the crust of the Pacific. Are we looking at the prelude to the world as we know it? This picture of our planet is a mere 200 million years from the present, a small space of time in the four and a half billion years of its existence. Is it possible that this was the beginning? Or were there other shapes and continents, earlier drifts and earlier oceans? 
Are we looking merely at a stage in a continual process? The answer is yes. And the evidence rises here in the heart of the supercontinent, near the point where North America and Europe will be separated by the still unborn Atlantic Ocean. This range of mountains, the Appalachians, stands as high as the Himalayas. And like the Himalayas, was probably formed by a closing ocean basin. 200 million years ago, Pangaea started to break up. The once landlocked Appalachians rode apart on the newly formed continents and in time were christened with new names. Inescapable, the movement of time watched them eroded to gentle rolling humps, nubbed and subdued like the well-thumbed features on an ancient coin. This is Newfoundland. These hills are the remnants of the old Appalachian Mountains. The scene is weirdly similar to parts of Western Scotland and even to parts of Norway. In the beautiful coves, little harbors, and along the coast, there are really fantastic rock exposures. And these rock exposures have become world famous, to geologists at least, because of the story they tell. And it's the story of the history of the formation of the Appalachian Mountains. And it's quite a history involving a shrinking ocean and the collision of two continents. This story began over 500 million years ago when Pangaea was divided by an ocean. Newfoundland was divided by that ancient sea. The western part of the island belonged to one continental mass, whereas the southeastern part of the island belonged to the opposing continental mass. Now off the edge of the old continent, we would have found pretty much the situation that exists today along the Atlantic coast, namely a continental shelf, continental slope dipping somewhat steeper and a deep ocean floor bottom. Now how do we know that, that an ancient ocean existed here? Well, the answer is simple. In Newfoundland we find rocks from the uh, ancient ocean floor bottom and from its continental slope. In fact, about a third of Newfoundland is underlain by rocks from ocean floor bottom. Such rocks are well exposed around Nipper Harbor. So 